Uh, we've been in this series. Uh, what's it called? What's the series called? Re, re, re means to, to do over and over again, or it also means to, to get back or take back. And so we, we talked about being refilled the first, the first Sunday. Then we got into recovery, the, the soul recovery, the emotional recovery. Then we talk about recovering the bag last Sunday. Were you here last Sunday? And so uh, I'm going to continue in the vein of that. Uh, but I do have some things I feel like are going to be extremely prophetic. God has, God has given me something to share for those that are in the room. And um, once I get there, I'll let you guys know to be, to be paying attention. But I'm excited to share what I got. If you got your Bibles, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Y'all got me a nice little cloth right here. Okay, Valente. It's the hem of his garment. Oh, no. Was it you? Uh, oh, it's Keon brought this. Okay. It's the hem of his garment. Y'all touch this, you're going to be healed. I'm going to sell it. This is the Benny Hinn Tower. You can purchase this, Presence Church Online, for a small donation. <laughs> $89.99. Lay this on your kids. They'll go to bed. Parents, if Jesus had a go to bed cloth, how many of y'all buying it? Y'all just. Go to sleep. I'm, I'm going to be first in line for that. I'm going to be broke, so I'm going to don't line. I got I to gotta get that cloth. <laughs> Shout out to Benny. That's my homie. Benny think it's possible. E Ezekiel 37, chapter 1, message version. Oh, the former alcoholics got a kick, a, a, a kick out of that. <laughs> I see y'all rolling. Y'all look, look. Hey, Pastor, don't even know. Don't, you don't even know Thanksgiving. It's Thursday. Linked up with Pookie, though. Well, I, I, I know how it is. Y'all still eating turkey? I'm going somewhere. I got to get my room how I want it. Y'all still eating turkey? Y'all still eating Thanksgiving leftovers? Raise your hand if you're still in. Oh, my, yo. Woo. Look, I, this is the first year one plate was it for me after. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Y'all, y'all, y'all special. Y'all different. Y'all different. I like it though. I like it though. I'm going somewhere. Anybody have somebody cook something? It was nasty, but you couldn't tell them. If you had a nasty dish this Thanksgiving, if they in the room, don't lift your hands. But I'm talking about the dish where you text your cousin, like, who made this? Who? Auntie Diane. God. <laughs> no, she can't cook. We all got one auntie that can't cook, but always want to try to cook. Little folks clapping their hand like, preach, pastor. We got one, everybody got one auntie that know they can't cook. But I always volunteer to bring a dish. Like, no, no, no. The Lord is kind. Ezekiel 37. Message version, right? Some of y'all getting delivered. I'm saying what y'all can't say to your family. Just send them this clip. Like, watch this. He was... Pastor, pastor was in the Word today. Watch this. He prophesied to you. <laughs> And I decree over you paper plates in the next season. Come on, who's that word for? Paper plates and utensils shall be what you walk in. Ezekiel, what chapter? I gave y'all time to get that. Now, if you're in Genesis, I can't help you. What chapter? 37. What version? Message version. Here it is. Ezekiel says, God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around and among them, a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones, bleached by the sun. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I said back to him, master God, only you know that. He said to me, prophesy over these bones. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. God, the master, 
told the dry bones, watch this. I'm breathing the breath of life to you. And you'll come to life. I'll attach sin news to you. Put meat on your bones. Cover you with skin. And breathe life into you. You'll come alive. And you'll realize that I am God. Ezekiel says, verse 7 through 8, So I prophesied just as I'd been commanded. If you was in deeper class, I would work that thing right there. I prophesied not what I felt. I prophesied just as I had been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound. This sounds just like Acts chapter 2. As I prophesied, there was a sound, an old rustling. The bones moved and came together. And I declare over someone in the room that some things are about to begin to come together. As I prophesied, some things... That's where I'm at today. Begin to come together. When I spoke what God told me to spoke, some things that were apart begin to come together. Bone to bone. He says, I kept watching sinews form. The muscles around the bones, the skin stretched over them, but they had no breath in them. I had structure, but no spirit. Verse 9, he said to me, prophesy to the breath because whatever I'm lacking he'll supply it (laughs) the bones came together but they had no breath God recognized it and said prophesy to the breath prophesy son of man tell your neighbor prophesy tell the breath God the master says come from the four winds come breathe come breath breathe on these slain bodies breathe life so I prophesied just as he commanded me the breath entered them and they came alive they stood up on their feet a huge army what was dead a few verses ago it's now an army verse 11 y'all still with me Then God said to me, son of man, these bones, pay attention, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There is nothing left of us. I want you to pay attention. This is a spiritual thing that's taking place. God grabbed me and took me in the spirit. All right, in verse 11, God tells you what these bones represent. He says, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up, our hope is gone. There is nothing left of us. Therefore, someone say, Therefore, I'm almost done. Give me give me two more verses. Therefore, prophesy. Tell your neighbor one more time, prophesy. That's going to be the theme throughout this entire message because this is a prophetic ministry. Somebody say, prophesy. Tell them, God, the master says, I'll dig up your grave because whoo, I learned that, th- that when, when God resurrected Jesus, it was not his first day on the job of resurrecting. I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive. Oh, my people. Then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up your graves and bring you out as my people, you realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you and you'll live. And then I'll lead you straight back to your land and you'll realize that I am God. Is my church still with me? Is my church still with me? I've said it. Are you reading the message version? I've said it and I'll do it. God's decree. I'm so bad that if I have to dig up your grave and bring you out of it, it don't matter what obstacle is in front of me because if I've said it, I'll do it. That's God's decree. I want to preach 
on rewrite. Someone say rewrite. Dot, dot, dot. The director's cut. I love Valente. You catch all the ad libs. Someone say the director's cut. Shout rewrite. Rewrite, rewrite. Here we go, here we go. God, we thank you for what's about to take place in these next 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes. Have your way, God. We love you. We honor you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone shout rewrite. Rewrite. Since the beginning, since the beginning, patriots and heroes of the Bible have been doing the best they can to describe God. Theologians today still struggle with finding the right words that truly articulate who God is and the many attributes that he has. Uh, 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 all throughout scripture, many people are struggling to grasp who God is. I said, till this day, someone say, till this day, theologians are still looking for the right words that can truly define and articulate who God is. When they call him one thing, he ends up being something else. When they say he's this big, he ends up being bigger than that. Are you with me this morning? We're still trying to find the right words to, to really articulate and define how big and how great God is. Are you with me? All throughout scripture, people are trying to define who God is. And I love how, I love how many of the women and men in the Old Testament, how they define God. They would define God based off of how they experience him. Because there are some things we learn about God in scripture. But if you really want to know God, have an experience with him. Is there anyone in the room or anyone watching that will say, yes, I learned some things about God in the word. But what I've witnessed in my own life has been enough to define how big God is. That's why you can't argue with me when it comes to the God I've served. You may can debate scripture, but you can't debate what God has done in my own personal life. Has God done something in your personal life that has solidified how good he is? Has God done something in your personal life that has solidified that he is a way maker. I read it and I lived it. I studied it and I lived it. Somebody say, I've experienced him. Write this down. It's the principle. It's the principle. This is Pastor Justin teaching. It's the principle. What they use to define God is what I call the principle of calling it how you see it. Ooh, I said, I said, how they... What they use to define God is what I call the principle of calling it how you see it. Tell your neighbor, call it how you see it. I had a preacher friend of mine, and he, he asked me a question. I love the question. I love thank you. He asked me a question. He said, I wonder what the angels see that make them call him holy, holy, holy day and night. That question by itself took me out. I wish I had a church. He says, I wonder what they see. I wonder what's happening that's causing the angels to never stop wanting to worship God. I wonder what they see that's causing them to say holy, holy, holy day and night. And I text back, perhaps they just calling it how they see it. Someone say, perhaps they just calling it how they see it. I see him holy in the daytime. So I say that he's holy in the daytime. I see that he's holy in the nighttime. So I say that he's holy. And then somebody say, call it how you see it. Woo, come on, come on, watch this, watch this. My mother called me and she says, she says, I'm a little concerned. She says, because I feel like in church now, I'm the loudest person in worship. She says, it feels like people don't open their mouths no more. Ain't nobody singing no more. Ain't nobody clapping no more. And I want to tell my mother today, 
don't be discouraged by what's around you because you just calling it how you see it Woo, when you have the right perspective you can't be quiet so when she is loud saying that he's good it's because she has personal revelation that he's good I'm just calling it how I see it if I what, could I submit that the issue with your saying is your seeing oh you missed it the reason why you can't say nothing is because you ain't seeing nothing but when you see a way maker something inside of you is going to say that he's a way maker when you see his favor you can't be quiet about his favor I came to preach on the most skipped day on the church calendar in the year somebody say call it how you see it Ooh, I love the Old Testament the Old Testament they would call it how they saw it Abraham witnessed God being Jehovah Jireh before he called God Jehovah Jireh we have the luxury of reading who he is before he does but in the Old Testament God got his name based on what they experienced Abraham said when I didn't have nothing he caused the ram to be caught up in the bush I saw a God that provided so I name him the God that provides. He is my Jehovah Jireh. He is my Jehovah Shammah. My abiding presence. When I didn't have drums, I still had his presence. When I didn't have a keyboard, I still had his presence. And so I call him Jehovah Shammah because I've seen him to be Jehovah Shammah. Somebody say, call it how you see it Abraham called him Jehovah Nisi the Lord will fight my battles because when he was on top of the mountain tired and discouraged Moses knew I'm not winning this battle in my own strength and he saw God show up to fight for him because the God you see is the God you'll talk about and the reason some of y'all ain't talking about him is because you're not seeing him Woo, come on church you think it's you causing you to wake up every morning but I see it's the Lord that's supplying all of my needs according to his riches and his glory is anybody seeing the right God this morning Woo, don't mess with me I've been working out because the God you see is the God you'll talk about your seeing has a direct impact to your saying. Woo. <laughs> Someone say, call it how you see it. One more time, say, call it how you see it. Woo. I saw him as a healer. So I say that he's a healer. I saw him, in, especially in the year of 2020, being away in the wilderness. So I say that he's away in the wilderness I see that he's holy so I say that he's holy I see that he's good so I say that he's good I see that he's faithful so I say that he's faithful Ooh, tell your neighbor if you see that say that if you see that say that David saw breakthrough so he called him Bel Perezim the lord of a breakthrough someone say call it how you see it all throughout scripture, there are many attributes we use to describe God based off what we've witnessed and experienced him do in our life. And while, and while there are many of these things to choose from, one of my favorites is that God is omniscient. Write that word down, omniscient. I'll spell it for you because I know we've been out of virtual learning for a week and you ain't use your brain. So, uh, O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T. O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T. Omniscient. Omniscient is a word that means to know everything. Having infinite awareness, understanding, and insight. 
God is omniscient. God knows everything. Is there anybody that know him as the omniscient God? He, he knows everything. He knows how many stars are in the sky. And not just how many. The Bible says he's given every star a name. And he can name every star that's in the sky. He knows the number of strands of hair that's on your head. Before your mother knew you, he knew you. Someone say he knows everything. Is there anybody that knows that he knows? He knows. He knows that alone should be enough to give your faith a boost this morning. Well, he knows what you cried about last night. He knows what bills are behind. He knows your real prayer request. Not the prayer request you give to your neighbor. He knows your real prayer request. And is there anybody got different prayer requests? I got prayer requests for the prayer line. And then I got a real prayer request that only me and God know about. Somebody say, I wish I had a real church. Because we say just pray for wisdom. But the real prayer request hit a little different. No, pray for me because I'm tired. I want to quit. He knows. Someone say he knows. Woo, I'm glad. But he's omniscient. He, he, he knows. Keon, why is that important? Because when God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? God already knows the answer. Someone say he knows everything. So when God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel knows this is a setup. Get ready to write. Because when God asks you a question, it's not because he needs information. It's because you need revelation. I'm going to say that again. I said because when God asks you a question, it's not because he needs information. It's because you need revelation. Ezekiel knows that God is up to something. Because he knows that God is omniscient. He knows everything. So watch this. Write this down. Write this down. God wanted to reveal to Ezekiel. Here it is. The problem. His purpose. His plan. And his partner. Write that down, write that down. God wanted to reveal to Ezekiel and asking this question. He wanted to reveal the problem, his purpose, his plan, and his partner. God brings Ezekiel to the valley to reveal the problem, his purpose, what else? His plan, and what else? His partner. One more time, he brings him to the valley and ask him a question to reveal the, the problem, his purpose, his plan, and his point. So I'm going to write the problem. Here it is. The problem isn't the bones. The problems, sorry, the dry bones represent something that's mentioned in verse 11. God says in verse 11, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There's nothing left. Because the problem, you think the problem ain't really the problem. The problem that Israel has is that they feel hopeless. Someone say hopeless. These dry bones represent hopelessness. The problem is Israel feel like this is the end for them. The problem is that they think that they're going to be wearing masks forever. Let's make it practical. The problem is that they think that they're going to be suffering in this disease forever. The problem is that they think they're going to be alone forever. And I don't know about someone in this room, but someone has been in a place where we feel hopeless. I keep talking to pastors all across the country. I talked to my friend yesterday. He said, right now, I got people in my church. And, and he says, I, I took a survey. He says, almost everybody somewhere in their life feels a little hopeless. Feels like this is not going to change. Like this thing is not going to get better. In the last three months, have you come across some days where you felt a little hopeless? 
I need, I just need three people. When you felt like, God, are we ever going to get out of this? Are we ever going to take this mask off? When we, <laughs> when the numbers go down, we hit another surge. Come on. Have you ever felt hopeless? He says, he says, Ezekiel, I'm bringing you out here. Because I want you to see the problem. Is that Israel feels like there's no way out of this. Israel feels like they have been left for dead. That their dreams are done. That the promises I've spoken over them, they feel like because of a pandemic, it's not going to happen anymore. The crisis has killed their faith. I'm bringing you out here, Ezekiel, to see this. Someone say the problem. One more time, say the problem. God says, this is a problem. They feel hopeless. But are you glad today? Watch this. That your pain is God's problem. God says, there's a problem. They're in pain. They're in hopelessness. But God says, that's my problem. I want to fix. I want to give you some affirmation this morning. Your father does not want to see you suffer. I'm going to give you some affirmation. Let me affirm some things when it comes to the character and the nature of God. God is good. He is a good God. He did not send a virus. I don't know what Bible you have been reading. The plagues were the Old Testament. When Jesus died on the cross, he nailed that, the blood of Jesus. If the blood of Jesus was adequate enough to cover the church during the first plague, that same blood has the same power to cover God's same people during this plague. Come on. Someone say, I'm covered. God doesn't want you to suffer. He don't want you to see. He don't want you to feel hopelessness. So he brings the prophet out. I'm Ezekiel today, just so y'all know. We role play. He brings the prophet out and says, tell my people, I got a purpose for them. Someone say the problem. And now say God's purpose. His purpose, write this down. God's purpose is what he wants to see. His purpose is what he wants to see. Is what he had on his heart. Is his intent behind creating you. And let me let someone know this morning. Your life still has. I want you to say it like you believe that for yourself. Your life still has. Your life still has. You are meaningful in the kingdom of God. Your life has me lift your hands right now i cancel now every spirit of suicide in the name of jesus come on you will not overdose you will not put that needle inside of you come on you will not kill yourself i cancel out premature death in the name of jesus why because your life has meaning your life has purpose god has an intent for your life he created you purpose so I don't know what voice is speaking to you but if it's not a voice of life we reject it now come on let's go back to renounce someone say I renounce it now your life has meaning the pandemic watch this the pandemic can't stop God's purpose for your life a divorce can't stop God's perfect purpose for your life being a single mother can't stop God's perfect purpose for your life. Being a stand-at-home mom can't stop God's purpose for your life. Come on, right, right, right now you said, God, I'm working a nine-to-five. Maybe God is using that to usher you into his purpose for your life. Someone say, God has purpose for my life. And I believe today you've stepped into the right room because God told me I am going to restore back to you. I, I'm going to restore you in a place of purpose. Someone shout purpose. I believe when restoration, restoration is God putting you back where he intended you to be at this point of life. I'm going to say that again. When God restores, he places you back into the time of where you should have been based off the original timeline of your life. 
Because when something is restored, it's better. If you take a car from, from the 1960s, it had a value back then, Lawrence. But if you restore that car in 2020, it's more valuable now. Why? Because it's been restored. And so restoration is not just getting back what you lost. It's getting back what you lost and catching up to where you're supposed to be. Is there anybody excited about restoration of God's purpose in this room? Someone say restore. God is going to restore you back into a place of purpose. No more wandering. I just have, I just have some things I'm speaking. I heard God speaking. It. It's, it's not going to come out maybe how, how you want it to come out. But I heard God say no more wandering. No more just working to pay bills. A life of purpose. Is there anybody that wants to live a life of purpose? Not just water, not just waking up and wondering what's, what's going to happen. God, I, I want to live a life of purpose. I want you to see the problem in Ezekiel. But in the midst of the problem, I have a purpose for these bones. Some people only see the problem, but they never get to see God's purpose. The problem, his purpose, what was the next one? His plan. His purpose is what he wants to see. It's what he had in his heart, his intent behind creating you. But his plan is how he wants to do it. Write that down. God's plan is how he, how he wants to do it. I know that you have a plan and there's a way that you want to do it. But God has a plan and it's based off how he wants to do it. And he said, he says, watch this. Here it is. Ezekiel, you see the problem? I have a purpose for the problem you see. And this is my plan. This is how I want to do it. I want you to prophesy. His plan is how he wants to do it. I want you to prophesy. Since the beginning, God has been looking at problems and been so God that all he had to do was speak over it. We would see a valley, a valley of bones and assume that there, are, there is way more that's going to go involved into solving this problem. But that's based off how you want to do it. And sometimes the frustration in your life is because you're trying to solve problems the way that you want to do it. Had Ezekiel come to the valley trying to fix the problem how Ezekiel wanted to do it, he would have been in a place of frustration and fatigue. But he knew that God had a way that he wanted to do it. And so God says, Ezekiel, here's my way. Prophesy to the bones. Let's teach a little bit. And I'm done. Give me that marker real quick. Where's that marker left? Someone say prophesy. Prophesy. Let's teach. Let's teach. Let's teach, Pastor. Write down prophecy and prophesy. Y'all all right? I said write down what? Write down prophecy and prophesy. This is how we're going to do it. I want you to prophesy. A prophecy, write this down, is what has already been written in the future. Let me I'm almost done. Write that down for me. A prophecy is what has already been written in the future. Ezekiel had done well with prophecy. Watch this, church. He could see into the future and bring back the information and tell it to the people. This is what I see. It's already, somebody say pre-written. It's already been pre-written. Now, this is probably not a Ezekiel prophecy. This is more like a Jeremiah prophecy. Jeremiah had to say some hard stuff. Like, hey, Y'all gonna die. 
Uh, if you read Jeremiah, he always cried because he always got some. Uh, uh, that was his anointing. So, so this is what Jeremiah, but we're gonna focus on Ezekiel. Jeremiah's like, listen, God tired of y'all. I'm just saying, say, you know, y'all got about three more weeks, and you're gonna be thrown into a pit. That's all I got. It's already pre-written prophecy. Uh, it's, it's there in the future. So when God gives you prophecy, Sharika, he allows you to see what's already pre-written in the future. So, so supernaturally, you step into one dimension and see something and bring that back into the current tense that you're in. I had a dream that there will be a shooting in a club. The shooting did not take place to the next week. It had already been established in the future. But the prophecy, God allowed me to step out of one tense, the present tense, does this make sense? To go into the future tense, see something that was getting ready to happen and bring that back into the now. That's prophecy. Do you, you got that? Does that make sense? Everybody got it? Raise your hand if you got it. We in, we in virtual learning. You got it. And so, so I see, I see what's already written. But God wanted to teach Ezekiel how to prophesy. Someone say prophesy. To prophesy, write this down, is to speak into existence the divine will and intent of God. Prophecy, prophecy is what's it's already established. I'm going into the future and bringing it to the now. But Zay, to prophesy is to establish. I'm in the now and speaking it into the future. I need you to catch this. Prophecy is already there. I'm bringing it to the now. He got that part. But I want you to learn how to prophesy. I want you to learn how to, from your now, speak something into your future. Prophecy is already written. But to prophesy, I want you to look at what's already written and change the narrative. Change the story. The prophecy may be, it's over. But to prophesy is to say that it's not over. I need you to catch this. The bones are in the valley. And by prophecy, when bones are in the valley, it's over. When you're in the grave, prophecy says it's done. This is the end. But I didn't bring you out here, Ezekiel, for prophecy. I brought you out here to prophesy. I want you to look at what people say is done and speak something different. Somebody say, change the narrative. Ooh, before I start talking, this is called, in Hollywood, Lawrence, the director's cut. Let me get some water, because we might go there. Someone say, the director's cut. In Hollywood, they have something called the final cut, and then there's the director's cut. I didn't know this, Lawrence, but the studio gets the last say-so on how a movie ends or the final cut. So even though I directed the movie, it's the studio that decides how they want it to end. And I learned, Will, that the director's cut will sometimes be remarketed. And they will say this version of the movie is the is a version that has the director's cut. What is the director's cut? I learned this. It's the director's original intent for how he wanted the movie to end. It's, it's the director that says, I know y'all watched it play out one way, but I'm putting out a new cut that's going to change how the story ended. Come on, I'm interjecting. And so when the studio said it was over, the director's cut says it's not over. When the pandemic says it can't happen, 
the director's cut says it can happen somebody say change the narrative I don't know what your story says right now but God says I want you to prophesy something different somebody say speak something different it's time to it's time to change the narrative Ezekiel they think that it's over Ezekiel they they're hopeless that's the problem but the purpose is I want I have I have in mind for them to be an army and here's my plan I need someone to prophesy what was the last one and I need a partner never in the text do you see God prophesy Ezekiel said what God said God never speaks to the boss Ezekiel is the only one that's talking to the boss there is something I want to do in the earth but I'm looking for a partner that will prophesy and I believe that God this morning is looking for some people that will say God if you want something to change in my life I will partner with you come on if that's you stand to your feet God I will partner with you if there's something in my life that you say is not over I will partner with you somebody say God if you're looking for someone to prophesy I'll prophesy to it Ezekiel becomes God's partner and now the problem becomes a platform for him to prophesy and I believe there's some instructions that it's time for us to begin to prophesy again to speak into existence the will of God the intent of God it's time to start back prophesying over your life saying things like no this is not what God intended for me this is not his plan for my life I know there is more that he purposed for me and God said don't just sit there and say nothing Prophesy over yourself. Tell yourself there is more. Tell yourself this is not over. It's time to prophesy. To prophesy over our children. To prophesy over our, our careers. To prophesy over our workplaces. To prophesy over our homes. It's time to, to open up our mouths again. We've been masked for, for six months. And the physical mass has now become a spiritual mass. And God is saying it, it's time for the church to speak again. To say something different again. God didn't come with a sermon. He came with a question. For some of you, he's saying, open up that notebook to what you wrote down five years ago. And he's asking you, can that live again? Open up your phone to, to what you wrote down just two years ago before all of this happened. And he's saying, can that, can that live again? And if you think it can live again, I love how he puts it on you. If you think it can live again, prophesy to it. If you think it's not over, say it's not over. You post it all, the, all day long that God said, stop that business. And it hasn't happened yet.
God is so faithful that he don't even give up on dry bones. By that time, we're done with it. For many of us, by that time it even gets into a casket and goes into the ground, we're done with it. But God is so faithful, even when it's just bones, he can still find hope in it. Even when it's just bones in the valley, he can still look at it and find hope in it. Bones represent structure. It represents structure. I got some prophecy for you. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. When we're faithless, he remains faithful. Simply meanings. God has not given up on what some of us have given up on. God has not given up on on what some of us have given up on. If you think it's still a chance that this thing can happen, prophesy to it. Look at the order. Watch this. He prophesied and the bones came together. Watch this. Which means that some of us are looking for the structure. But you don't see a structure until you start speaking. Some of us are wondering, God, how is this going to come together? But it didn't come together before Ezekiel started prophesying. God says, when you begin to, to prophesy, when you begin to speak it, you'll start seeing some stuff come together. You'll start seeing the structure for it and how this is going to happen. And then the supernatural gets involved. He says, I'll, he says I will call flesh to come upon that structure. That's his part. That's the, that's the supernatural part. If you do your part, God can't do his part. But God can't do his part until you do your part. Prophesy. I'm ready to move. I'm ready. I'm ready to bring some things together. I'm ready to, to, to call some things to come alive again. But I can't start until you start speaking. This is what I heard. It says it's time to make critical decisions. He says, but these decisions will set up your future. He says, I'm going to cause, cause a wind to blow upon the structure. He says, the wind will be my grace, my anointing, and my favor. For this thing, for this thing, I will give you favor with me and favor with me. This is my favorite part. He says, I will cause resurrections during a global pandemic. I will cause resurrections during a global pandemic. What some people have buried because of a pandemic, how resurrected. Here is the most important part. This is the season for something in you to come alive again. And I had to circle this last sentence because it hit me hard. It says, he says, it can't wait any longer. It is now or never. It can't wait any longer. It is now or never. Lift your hands. 
something is coming alive with you again, and you again. Come on, if you believe that, that's not for everybody. Just for, just, for, just for those that believe there's something in me that I believe can live again. And God says today, go ahead and prophesy, today something is coming alive again. I'm causing a resurrection to happen in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of crisis. Play it out for the Something's coming alive again. Something in you is coming alive again. Things that you've buried, God has resurrected. No more wandering, no more confusion about your purpose. We prophesy now, God, that you will restore us your purpose for our lives, God. Lives of intentionality. In Jesus' name, God, what is it? What's the problem, God? We'll prophesy over it. We'll speak to it again, God. We'll dig up those old prayers. We'll dig up those old promises, God. And we'll speak over them again. To come alive in us again, God. come on what you bury because of breakups God says I didn't want that relationship to cause this to die so I'm resurrecting it again come on I didn't want that divorce to kill this so I'm resurrecting it again I didn't want that foreclosure to kill this so I'm resurrecting it again it's coming alive again Come on, I declare over you that it's coming alive again. I prophesy over you the purpose of God in your life is coming alive again. Come on, there's a wind that's coming. Come on, we prophesy to the four winds, God. Breathe on your son. Breathe on your daughter. Breathe on that mother. Breathe on that father, God. It's coming alive again. No more wandering in the wilderness. Purpose in Jesus' name. Your promises are coming alive again. Your will is coming alive again. Your intent for us. It's coming alive again. If you prophesy, I prophesy the purpose of God over your people. I prophesy the, the manifestation of the will of God over your people today. I prophesy longevity over every business owner. I prophesy longevity. I prophesy that with long life, he will satisfy you. I prophesy joy to everyone that feels alone in this season. I prophesy the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Prophesy to every every mother that that gave up their lives to raise children. Every mother that decided to stay home and, and sacrifice their dream to raise kids. Prophesy the purpose of God. God, I feel that I prophesy the purpose of God. It's coming alive in you again. No more wondering about what's next. Prophesy you will know your identity in Christ. We speak to the four winds and we say come. 
blow on us, God. The wind always represents the, the presence of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to accomplish the purpose of God. Come on, we speak to the four winds. Breathe on us, God. Empower us, God, to accomplish and achieve the purpose of God for our lives. There's a wind coming. There's a wind coming. There's a wind coming. God is breaking that that bondage that causes you just to want to lay in bed because you feel like your life has no meaning he's breaking that today you're going to wake up with purpose something to work on we crucify that laziness God we speak life never intended just to happen to us we speak life we speak what we desire to see sometimes it's the simplicity that causes it to be, to be the most complicated thing speak it God let me deal with this while I'm here some of you may be saying it's not enough just to speak it yes it is here's why because the more you speak it your brain begins to respond and go in the direction of the thing that you're speaking so we're not saying speak and fold your arms it's impossible to say something over and over and over again and your life not react to it so the more you speak it the more your body gets involved with it the more you speak it the more your mind adjusts to it it's called muscle memory and there's some things your body won't do because your mouth not speaking it the more you have to speak it more 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 it's not good enough to say it one time prophesy it more than one time prophesy it more than two times keep saying it until your life begins to reflect it I'm done I'm done God says he can't wait any longer it's now or never God, we thank you for the grace to rewrite some things that have already been pre-written. The enemy feels like this year is going to end one way. But God, we prophesy and we rewrite it based off the director's cut. The world is projecting things to go one way. But God, we rewrite it based off the director's cut. It's not what CNN says. It's not what Fox News says. It's what God says. Basically, what God is telling Ezekiel is they say it's over. But I'm giving you the pen to rewrite something differently. In 
And if you think this can live, prophesy, write it out. And I challenge you, lift your hands, and I charge you to write the vision, to rewrite it out. This week up, bring it to our minds again. As we prophesy, as we write, begin to bring structure. Put your spirit on it, God. And I thank you right now that the prophetic mantle that, that my wife and I bear, God, I pray that you begin to just extend that mantle to all of our people, God. That mantle to speak, that mantle to prophesy, that mantle to wake up and decree what God is saying over our seed, over our, over our livelihood, God. That, that, that power to speak, God. Release it onto your people today. Father, we thank you for that now. We love you. And God, we honor you. It's in Jesus' name. Somebody say, speak it. Come on, say, speak it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're in this room and, and you've never given your heart to Jesus, or maybe you're watching online, He loves you. He loves you where you are. There's nothing you have to do to be more prepared for Him. He loves you right here. I want to offer an invitation for you to, to give your life to Him. If that's you, you say, God, today I want to give my life to you. Just lift your hands. If you're watching online, everyone just pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross. You've been raised again on the third day so I could have eternal life with you and the Father in heaven. I receive your love and I receive salvation. Jesus name. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for salvation in this room? Come on, come on, clap better than that. Someone shall rewrite it. You may be seated, you may be seated.